Okay, welcome to Fox Tunnel. And here's the, so that corridor is the original tunnel. And that connection, those two guys are walking, is a connected, uh, so it's an uh, interconnection between old and new tunnel. So we will, you will see both of them. And let's start from the very interesting and fascinating thing I mentioned. Some uh, micro remnants of uh, micro remnants of the ancient animals. You can see here. I think it's bison's bison's bone. Yeah. But else, uh, you can see a lot of, of uh, plant plants remnants here. Roots, the grass, sage, and other 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 vegetation. Here the same and. So later you will see the roots uh, on the side. You remember how, so we are at the layer, uh, now we're in the layer of synthetogenic deposits. Do you remember how they are forming when uh, ground surface is uprising due to sedimentation? But still, every year you have some grasses growing on the ground surface, and uh, in a few years after, the, most sediments will be deposited at the ground surface. That vegetation will be buried and eventually translate to the, the frozen state, the permafrost. But still, it will be a lot of uh, roots and, and even above ground biomass. That, that root do not propagate for future leaders. Just imagine that that uh, that roots might be like three twenty five thousand years. And here you can see some uh, shrubs, peaks, probably willow shrubs. And I would say in combination with that gravel layer, so probably it was uh, again. 20,000, I, I don't know how many, some, several tens of thousand years ago, here was a kind of small creek with uh, that, that, that rocks because of erosion and that uh, willow shrubs grow in this, this creek. And the first ice wedge. We will see more and bigger and more and more city. Yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. So is this the gray or milky way? Is it that, is it, this is the gray version that you're talking about, right? Yes, okay. so it's a synthetic guys. It's a different type. So we, uh, a little bit uh, further at that uh, way, we will see uh, thermocarscape ice, uh, thermocarscape ice. So Gary mentioned about the sublimation, why we have so much dust here. And you can see that horizontal cracks here, right? That is a former ice layers. And ice was just sublimated. So here you can see it is still there. But in many places it's all, uh, all <laughs> sublimated. You can't even tell it's evaporated. So you can see here and uh, uh, in all uh, other high wedges we just passed and we'll see later. So it's kind of stripy, a lot of stripes. And each of these stripes, it's a similar, similar like a, a tearing. So all of them show that annual cracks and annual uh, cycles of growing of these ice wedges. So because definitely it's not distilled water leaking inside that cracks which are forming during the real cold winter. So uh, this water contains some suspended uh, material. So many people do studies and use that unique opportunity for sampling. So here people took uh, samples of uh, ice wedges. Uh, and you know, ice wedge is very interesting object because of the way how does it grows. It grows both vertically and horizontally. So if you need the time sequence of your samples, 
it's not like a normal deposit. So the deeper you go, the older uh, sample you have. So here you have to properly, actually, you have to sample it both vertically and horizontally. Ideally, it should be like a grid of samples. So here I want you to point your attention to the deformation of the uh, ice layers. I mentioned at the very end of my lecture uh, last Thursday. So when uh, ice wedge grows sidewards, it pushes material and creates some forces which uh, cause this deformation of ice layers. annual cracks. If you would have more time and if you, if you would be more curious, you could try to count it and figure out how long time did it take with a nice wedge. Definitely different oh. eyes, right? You can see it even visually. And again, as I mentioned, from my experience, the places it's kind of in genetic eyes usually is more like a grayish. And uh, thermocast cave eyes or epigenetic eyes, which is there, more like a milky white. And also, all these milky white layers, uh, ice is associated with uh, that deposits with uh, chaotic cryogenic structure. So you don't have really well pronounced patterns. Just some uh, some ice layers, very unorganized, and it is typical cryogenic structure for freezing of land waters in the time. So what what happened here? Uh, Obviously, you have to, well, looking on that picture, you have to understand that it happened not in one moment. It took tens of thousands of years to form it. And obviously, even if you are talking about the 100 years time scale, a lot of a lot of things and changes can happen on the ground surface. So it might be some erosion, some uh, vegetation changes, changes of climate, changes or changes of uh, sedimentation condition. And what we have very often, it's a erosion following the growing ice wedges, just stream erosion. Sometimes it might create some caves on side of ice and water will propagate there. And then because we still, uh, sometimes when sedimentation uh, will recover, uh, resume and will continue that uh, all these uh, caves uh, form with erosion will be frozen, filled with some, some material and frozen. And that's what we have here. You can see here is a layer. Uh, here is a layer of that uh, frozen mud overlaid with uh, uh, some some uh, other ice, and then ice wedge on top of uh, again. So I can imagine what some at some moment it was just a cave, which was partially filled with the, this muddy uh, muddy deposits, and with some water over it. And eventually it was buried and uh, moved, uh, uh, refrozen. And what, what do we have? So we have a frozen, uh, frozen mud and an ice. But the, the age of of that white ice and the gray ice next to it will be different. So the white ice will be uh, younger than that around. Christ stratigraphy actually started. So looking on the substance, looking on the sediments, we are trying to reconstruct the conditions which took place. And it is not only actually it's uh, it is important not only in terms of just general reconstruction of environment, but uh, yeah. But uh, if people will take samples, for example, for microbiological studies or for biogeochemistry, people have to understand what, what was going on when uh, the time when the deposits they sampled. Uh, been formed. And obviously, if they will take, for, for example, if uh, people will take the uh, samples for isotopic analysis from here and from there, it's, it's pretty much close to each other. Uh, the results will be totally different. Yes, what was your question? Well, yeah, with respect to the ice stratigraphy, so is the white ice deposited on the top of the gray 
years, so to speak, on the site. So it was some kind of corrosion that, that might you know, make some cream uh, inside the ice. Uh, maybe you know, the ice growing might stop from the white is you and uh, start again after that layer of white ice. At one of my research sites, I, I did show you some pictures of previous lecture, actually, when I visited that site a couple times with students. At the very first day, I knew exact place, which looks like a normal surface with a bit of tundra vegetation on it. And I said, okay, now just keep quiet walking here, and then, then we can hear water running underground, and then we took a shovel and just broke that vegetation layer, and you can see like two or three meters deep, uh, like a well there is just the erosion feature and i told better to not walk this area at all if you walk at least keep quiet and listen as soon as you can hear running water underneath better get out because if you uh, fall there there is a chance you will, you will not be able to survive Yeah, here also you can see the deformation of ice, ice layers bending or I told it's a time machine, the sun was time machine and we are going down, we are moving to the different uh, geological time. Here that uh, gravelly layer I mentioned, the reason of existence of the ocean. If the age of that uh, Silver deposits in the water up to 10,000 years ago. Here it's more like a kind of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little I mean, disturb him is the ice wedge just growing. Or? Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's talk about that, uh, that, that chapter. part of the tunnel and here we can see uh, that, that pretty much whole section from the places in deposits to the early quaternary gravel layer and eventually really ancient uh, bedrocks uh, it's a birch, birch creek schist layer it's right there you can go in touch So it's a bedrock layer right oh, yeah, there, yeah. Uh, Birch Creek. Yeah, it's so when we are talking about disturbances and geology, it was definitely a big break in sedimentation and a lot of erosion happened, uh, let's say, at that moment, at that time period. It was not a moment, it was a long time period. After that layer been formed, before uh, that places in deposits start to accumulate. We don't know, we do not even know how long time did it take. And how, uh, so how much of this gravel layer, original gravel layer is actually eroded. And here and there, there is a very good, uh, yeah, let's talk about it here. So it is a sim cryogenic deposit. We have seen genetic ice wedges. But that part of this ice wedge, 
1591, which propagates into ancient deposits. Technically speaking, it's epigenetic. So relatively, that deposits its epigenetic ice wedge. And this one is syngenetic, so it's been formed synchronously with the deposition of that layer. Does it make sense? See a propagation of ice and you see that crack is already partially filled, not with ice, but with some uh, some sediments which just fell down and into the into the crack. So one of my favorite places now. We are staying at the center of Polygon, surrounded with ice wedge. wedges. So here you can really see what it forms some, some green. And we are now at the center of Polygon. So at the lecture last Thursday, we were talking about the geological genesis of that kind of sediments, synchrogenic sediments. And Gary probably mentioned what mostly here it's a wind blown early on sediments. But here is a feature which supports actually, you do you remember I mentioned what I'm, I'm, I will support the idea what is polygenetic formation. And here is a layer which kind of supports of this hypothesis. I can barely imagine how that kind of material can be uh, uh, deposited by wind. It's too coarse grain. So definitely, mostly yes, mostly the whole the whole layer was formed by by the uh, like, uh, due to uh, early on, as a as a result of early on or wind blown deposition. But at the same time, at some local places, some other processes might contribute to it. That might be some gully formation, some creeks, some small puddles or ponds, which uh, provide different genes of deposits. And definitely, it's what we have here. So more coarse grained, I can imagine what it might be some, some erosion here, which brought some more coarse grained material from uh, up there, because Tens of thousand years ago, we could probably see the uh, bedrocks uncovered with, with the sealed uh, that way. So it probably was a hill with a lot of uh, exp exposition of uh, bare, uh, bare uh, solid rocks, which had been eroded and uh, weathered and then uh, redeposited to here. We are different mechanisms. It might be different mechanism involved. It might be some uh, fluvial deposits, it might be some slope deposits. I don't want to use the word solifluction here because solifluction is usually more typical for fine grain sediments, but something like landslides. So to really understand uh, the process of formation of, of that of, of the whole this layer, we probably have to uh, go around the whole uh, Fairbanks vicinity and see, okay, probably go like in a place, uh, like a summit of Murphy Dome and try to imagine, okay, probably uh, at the very, bo at the place where we are, well, like over there, the sediment, the, the environment looked more like a uh, top of the hill now. And then move to another place and say, okay, probably part of that layer being formed under the environment like we have here, more like a, a mid slope. And in some areas, like uh, with, with this uh, gravel or sandy area, it might be some small streams. You can 
let's see. So once I provided a talk at uh, AGU meeting about the carbon and permafrost, and the idea was to uh, to show people that both quantity and quality of carbon uh, in permafrost might change with depth depending on condition of sedimentation and history of development of this layer. And I was so glad what, uh, what right before my talk was another presentation about special variabilities of carbon uh, associated with different types of soils and uh, different types of uh, ecotypes. And I told, okay, just imagine now, so turn it from horizontally to vertical and imagine what during that several thousand years when the deposits, uh, the sediments we sampled for, for carbon being formed, we had changes of uh, environmental condition. And you see that it was, uh, now we have a huge variety, uh, variability of the biogeochemical parameters working from different ecotypes, but it's the same, it's the same uh, it works the same way when you use not not like a spatial but time variability and changes of condition over time. Okay, let's keep moving. Yeah, be careful with these tapes because our colleagues still do some studies. Yuri Shur and Misha Kanyevsky. Yeah, here another thing. You see the gravel layer underlaid and overlaid with, with silt. So probably was some erosion event and then uh, deposition of this area of sediments again. Yeah, we will just walk back this new uh, hallway. That's pretty much what I thought to tell you. If you will have any questions or you have it now, feel free to ask. Or probably you have to digest it and we will have more time on uh, Thursday before my lecture. We can, we, can, we can talk a little bit more about what you learned. And just enjoy. And yeah, watch your step here.